and the easiest way to get us liquidated is to bastardize us so we would be less effective the next time the Controller General comes around. For instance, in Newark, New Jersey, we have one counselor for 15,000 employees. Now, can you imagine how hard he tries to do that? And they now appointed him a dual job. He is also the regional coordinator. So part of the time he's in the region, the other time he's over there. He doesn't have time to educate, identify, or do anything else. He has no time for counseling. He isn't even a good referral point. But by doing this in enough areas, they are hoping, the one element that is opposed to what we're doing, they are hoping that they can put us in a shape where they cannot deal as they have dealt now with us and saying that we are a profit. We are making a profit. For instance, in a profit, I'm sure you've got it right here someplace, but in the congressional testimony that we arranged for the Postmaster General to be at on the 18th of May, when he got called to a board of member, board of uh, governors meeting, and Carlin had to deliver it from him, he made the statement in there, which I think is a very beautiful thing. One, they admitted for the first time that they had over 10,000 people have come through this PAR program. Over 6,500 of them are maintaining their sobriety. The Controller General, when he came into the Postal Service and inspected us, it took him almost nine months to do it, came up with a cost savings in 1977 of $17 million net. Now that's fine for the businessman, that's fine for the budget people. But when you think of all of the desolation that's saved and all of the hearts and all of the homes and all of the children, and we do have 12 million children in the United States being raised by one or two practicing alcoholics. You can see the impact that this has on our overall thing. So we decided to go in from a union front and lay out the PAR program as it was originally designed with all of the criteria, all of the regulations. The fact that, just to give you a few instances, the PAR program would become district-wide again. There would be no answering to E and LR officers. Most e and officers, even if they're sympathetic, don't understand what we're about. They cannot communicate with the alcoholic. They've got their rules and their regulations and their disciplines and their attitudes, and they don't know where we're coming from. So as a result, a lot of them become alienated and take it out on the park counselors. Because of this misunderstanding, uh, we have in the contract that we will go back to the fact that the technical control of the program will be strictly from the park counselor, to the district park counselor, to the regional park counselor, who will be a recovered alcoholic with a minimum of seven years continuous sobriety, and then into the national one, which will have a minimum of 10 years continuous sobriety. That will be the technical control, and the technical control at the national will not answer to anyone. They will be accountable for program results, but technically there is no one in the Postal Service and headquarters other than the people who have dealt in the program who are qualified give technical control and technical administration too. This is what the unions are fighting for. This is one of the things the unions are fighting for this time. The administration control for leave and so forth, yeah, we'll leave that at the post office level, that's fine. We have no argument with that. But technical control of the program, the operation, has got to be pure because this is one of the things we established in the beginning. We have 24,000 post offices all over. We got 24,000 postmasters. We got good postmasters, drunken postmasters. We got insane postmasters. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got friendly postmasters, and we've got cooperative postmasters. So we got everything that any population has. And so we can't let the fate of the program, which is so delicately attuned to the human being and the alcoholic, be run by somebody who doesn't understand the problem. So that's why we have, have gone about in this fashion of getting our role. We have taken, I, I made quite a few phone calls, including to Bob here to get his input, and I'm going to send Bob a copy of it as soon as I finish typing, of about 20-some pages of stuff that we are insisting on this time. We are also insisting on a drug program. The drug program is to be a separate program to be placed at least two major cities within each region in the first year of the contract negotiations. We have many, many things in there, and one of the things that I love the best is the one thing that will assure not only longevity for the alcoholic program, 
in here, but will be a model for every other alcoholism program other than the dirty words I see here, paper programs. We are coming in this time with a new concept of one penny per hour work of all postal employees, whether they be union or non union. One penny per hour work. And with this almost $20 million a year in revenue will be put in one pot. The first thing that will be done with that pot is to pay the Postal Service reimbursement for all of the PAR employees. That means you will be postal employed with all of the benefits in that, but you will not be within the administration and control of that. You will be truly a neutral pad. You will not be labor and you will not be management. You're going to be there for one reason, and that's to help the alcoholic. And that's why we've got that thing in there. We have many other things. That will also be a slush fund for helping people who do not have insurance, have inadequate insurance, have domestic problems at home that need some help until they get resolved. This pot will be truly a beautiful thing where we can expand into other social programs as we see fit. It will be run by a committee of three union personnel and two management personnel. We're hoping very hard, we've got all of the unions supporting this and we're hoping that goes through. Another thing that we have done that has many ramifications down the road, we have for the first time come in with a contract which separates work contract from human beings. We're saying, okay, hours, attendance, leave, productivity, all of this stuff you put on one kind of a contract. And another contract over here, you put everything that has to do with human beings. You carry it a step further. Instead of just doing it within the postal environment, like we do PAR, we will establish a joint responsibility of labor and management to go beyond the limits and the environments of the Postal Service to aid employees and the problems of their families to help them satisfy their needs and to resolve their problems, whether it be legal, familial, alcoholism, drugs, no matter what it is, to take a, a means of carrying information, referral, and assistance outside of the Postal Service. And this will be part of our human contract that the unions are supporting, the AFL, CIL are supporting. And we're looking upon this in the classification of the first time through. It's never been done in industry. We don't know whether we're going to win this one or not, but we're certainly going to give it a try. I know and I want to express my gratitude to all of you people who have worked so hard in making this program a success. I might have designed this program, but I didn't operate this program. This program is operated by the sweat and the tears and the frustration and the angers and the heartaches and the confusion and the bitterness and the love and everything else of the counselors. The counselors are the most important ingredient that we have in this program, and this is what makes this program so outstanding. Above all other programs that I have looked at in this nation, Above all other programs that I've looked at in, in foreign nations, I've gone to Europe, I've gone to Yugoslavia, I've gone to South America and I've seen nothing to touch it. Because of the dedication and the sacrifice of these counselors. Now we've had some hellacious experiences with the counselors. They've lost their families, they've lost their loved ones, they have given of themselves to that particular extreme. And in Return and reward for that, they got rewarded by such things as PTAC. <laughs> and it was frustrating. It was frustrating to Baylor, who was the Postmaster General. It's a frustrating experience, and thank to God we had a judge that had a little common sense and came back and obliterated that. But we have looked at our struggles in alcoholism and we have highlighted because we are so intensely interested in the disease and in helping the person who is still suffering as an alcoholic to do that we get frustrated we can't understand why supervisors who know they have drunks out there don't send them to us but it's a slow process you see we're trying to overturn about six thousand years of history since man got out of that tree and got out of that pool Alcoholism has been pretty much an accepted thing in quite a few places in the world and has been accepted in this country. If you go back to the beginning of this country, 
But we're amateurs compared to the alcoholism and consumption, for instance, of John Paul Jones and his ship. Their biggest cargo was not guns. The bigger cargo they ever carried was rum. And that was just a piece of cool metal. So we are, we're fighting, in the short 10 years almost of this program, we're fighting a tremendous battle. And we're having people standing on the sidelines and they're looking at us. And whether or not we will continue having effective alcoholism programs and better alcoholism programs in the future will depend upon how the PAR system continues to operate. I've asked all of you before, I'll ask you again, please bear with me. Things are going to be much better. Things are happening in Washington that will make it much better. And sooner or later, I think we will realize a lot of the things that we set as goals 10 years ago. Right now, I'm working on quite a few programs. One of the programs that I'm working on is sponsored by Rosalind Carter and the White House. And slowly but surely, they're getting indoctrinated in there on alcoholism because that happens to be my favorite. <coughs> we're now going into Oakland on this White House program, and we're coming into Los Angeles, and we're going into high schools. We've got a high school, a junior high school, and a grammar school in Oakland that we're going into to what we call the Cities and School Program, which is very similar to the old Postal Street Academies. We're putting counselors full-time in that school to deal with the kids and deal with their problems. It's been so successful that in Indiana, we have right now 2,000 students in the Indiana public school system that are going to, not the regular high schools, not the regular junior high schools, but the city and the schools. And the heart of this program are counselors from public health service, probation services, and everything else. And they're turning the kids around. But they missed the biggest thing of all. They had no counselors there for alcoholism. So in Oakland, we are going to start putting in alcoholism counselors. We will have alcoholism counselors in the high schools, junior high schools, and in the grammar schools, and they'll have three jobs in there. They will be responsible in their groups of 40 kids to deal with those kids that have the alcohol problem. They will be responsible for educating that school, and by the very fact that they're full-time employees in the school system there, they'll be listened to more because they're within the system. And they will educate the kids on alcoholism and the progression of it and what can be done about it. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, they will go into the families and work with the families to resolve their problems as it affects the kids in the school system and causes them to be cruents, juvenile delinquents, non-attenders, slow readers, and all the rest of the <coughs> ills, which when we go back into the families, we always find out someplace around there there's an alcoholic. And so this is what we're about right now, and that's one reason I'm down in L.A., and that's probably one reason why I'll be down drinking coffee in this power office for the next year or so, because we are working with kids. In L.A., we picked up a guy that's helping us find job opportunities, Rosie Greer. And I'm sure Rosie would have liked to have been here tonight, but he's got to go to a charity thing over in, in Las Vegas. But he is equally interested. He is equally cognizant of the problem in the inner city of alcoholism. Not just alcoholism in the kids, but alcoholism in the parents, too. So slowly or surely, the little ripples that have emanated from the PAR program from the beginning are beginning to spread and spread, and they're touching more and more people's lives. Germany sent a man from the postal system over here to interview NIAAA. He so happened that he talked to a good friend of mine, Barry Montague, up there, who didn't even hesitate. He put him on the next airplane and sent him down to me. <coughs> and now the man has taken about a bushel full of postal literature back to Germany to try to talk them now to putting in the power system in the German post office service. So the ripples and the dedications, Bob and all of you who have participated in the PAR program have not been in vain. We're getting there. We're getting there slowly. Uh, being good alcoholics, we're extremists. We want overnight success. Well, when most of us came in, we wanted 20 years of writing the first week, too. <laughs> but it does take time. We are going in the right direction. The objectives are getting to be a little closer to us all the time. When I came in tonight, I had a very nice words from a redheaded nurse here who was telling me that in all of the deals that she's had with alcoholism, that this is the finest program. And those are the kind of endorsements you have to have to make PAR live throughout the whole country and eventually throughout all of the countries of the world. I want to thank each one of you. I want to thank the counselors and their families. I want to thank their families for putting up 
with me and for putting up with the counselors. I'm sure many times you cussed me, but don't feel bad. My wife does the same thing because I'm always gone. But I love you all, and I thank you very much for having me. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping. In Albany, New York, got an article about the PAR program, uh, one of the publications. They made a copy and sent it to me at my home. I got on the phone the following day, and I, wrote, I called the... Massachusetts, first called Washington, D.C., and then New York and Massachusetts, and I think I find, I'm almost sure I finally located Stan Day in uh, San Francisco. And I told Stan at that time that I was retired from the post office, but any time that he came into the Los Angeles area, although I wasn't interested in a job, that I would be wheels for him or help carry his bags or whatever to get the program going in the Los Angeles area. And then I followed up with a short note to him uh, in appreciation for what he was doing for the drunk that still suffers. Um, I didn't hear anything else from Stan Day. And then, uh, hey, because he was making coffee, and this time he said, just do it because you're here. So. Uh, I think that because of the size of the crowd, that if uh, stand wherever you want to speak from, you want to sit down, speak, stand up, speak. I don't really care. I just uh, I'd like to say that uh, Stan is the designer of the finest industrial program in alcoholic recovery in the world. Uh, I'm having fights on a weekly basis with other people that have just paper programs where employees come in and they're really used to get rid of alcoholic employees and are just frosting them. Uh, and I have people, uh, we had an occasion recently where uh, a man at one of these meetings took uh, exception to the fact that we do have the finest program in the world and uh, took a chair and got up front and made a complete ass of himself because the people in the audience knew what the PAR program was and knew how we work and know that the majority, the vast majority, knew that we had the finest program. I think one of the reasons is that we have recovered alcoholics as counselors. They've been there. They understand. They understand the problem with supervisors that they had. Uh, they'll they'll walk all the way with the people and then another step. My instructions have been to the counselors to do anything that's necessary to help employees and ex-employees and families. I said that I really don't care who it is that's suffering from alcoholism. If they come here for help, we're going to help them. And uh, that we've done. We have had the good fortune to be called from Washington on one case that probably a number of you people know, the individual, is in another branch or was in another branch of, of civil service. And we're hoping he's going to get back and get, get, a, good, uh, get, get a good settlement from him. Um, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I went through a little bit of my story uh, the last time, but I'm sure you didn't come here to hear about my story. I'd just like to tell you that I was a primary alcoholic and that when I finally came into the AA program, I had three wives. And if you want to hear how that came, uh, came about and what I did about it after I got the program, come back next week. <laughs> uh, Stanley Day. My name is Stanley Day and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Stanley. Bob solved his problem. He's now got five wives. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing as I've been sitting around here tonight and looking at a lot.
lot of people that have come into the program, a lot of the counselors who have worked with the program and everything else, and thinking back to the days pre-PAR and into the alcoholism community and how we would get 12-step calls all night after we came into AA and we would run all over the country making talks and everything else like that. And really scrounging like mad to find a drunk and to work with a drunk so that he could sober up and, and try to motivate the person to attain and maintain sobriety and all the heartaches and everything else that we would do just to get one or two. And then to come into something like this and see the number of people who have successfully been motivated in a formal program to achieve and to attain and to maintain their sobriety. It's indeed a program of progression, just like the disease of alcoholism is a disease of progression. Only this time we're headed in the right direction. Tonight I expected at the second meeting for a woman who I love very, very much and who Carr has very, very much owing to be here, but she is an illness and tonight she was unable to make it and that's Betty Edwards. And the young lady sitting on the couch over there reminded me of the fact that the first time that I talked to Betty before we even had a PAR system started, she was at the, at the house with Betty when I addressed her. And just to let you see a little bit of the picture of PAR as we started out, I'm going to go back and reminisce a little bit. I'm not going to go into too much of my trunk along because if I do, I'll take till 5 o'clock in the morning. But I will go back first and talk a little bit about Betty and the impact that she had on me and the impact she had on PAR. I had tried through a few postmaster generals to get permission to put in the PAR program. And somehow or another, I was never able to kindle much of a flame. There was always something that came up. And year after year, I would throw the program in the drawer and go about my job, which was the director of review and analysis for the Postal Service. Finally, Marvin Watson came in as a postmaster general. And I tackled Marvin Watson with about the same enthusiasm that I had O'Brien and Ed Kronowski. And this time, I had something working for me. The first thing was the fact that Marv Watson was not an alcoholic. He was a deep water Baptist from Texas, and he hated the word alcohol. So we had that in our favor, and we started to work on that, but even he, as a cabinet officer, didn't want to stand up to the president in a cabinet meeting and say, hey, I put in a program for alcoholism for drunks in the Postal Service, because he knew what the retort would be is now that's the reason why I never get my mail. That's the reason you're all screwed up. You got drunks working for you. But finally, we had a staff assistant that he had brought from Texas that he thought very much of, and the staff assistant's mother was the woman who put in the first mental health program in the state of Texas. So I gave a copy to the staff assistant, and he took it home and showed it to his mother, and <clears throat> she read it. And she told him, she says, I'll tell you what, son, when you go back, if you don't support this program, don't come into this house again. She says, I've never put a program in on mental health and gone into a family that had a mental health problem that somewhere or another we didn't run into alcoholism. And if we're ever going to do something for our mental health, we've got to do something about the alcoholic. And this is one of the paradoxes of our time that right now we're talking an awful lot about mental health. And you can do a lot of things in mental health if you don't help the alcoholic. But if you help the alcoholic, you help mental health. Anyway, Marv Watson finally, after about three or four months of arguing, decided to <coughs> let me go ahead and try. And he laid out the conditions of the tryout, which was to be in San Francisco. And I chose San Francisco for a few reasons. One, it was isolated on a peninsula. Secondly, it had a good mix of blacks and, and uh, Asiatics and, and whites. And I thought this was a good way to test out the program to see whether everybody had the problem and prove that it worked. Also, the fact that uh, I was born and raised in Oakland and that was 3,000 miles away from Washington is a good place to go. So that was to be the model. I went out with the model and the statement by the Postmaster General that you can go there if you get any bad publicity at all, I can't stand publicity because the presidential election is coming up, and so we can't stand any bad publicity. If you get any, don't bother coming back to Washington. Just stay out there and find yourself another job. 
So if you want to go, well, you can go ahead and go. Well, I said, I'm leaving tomorrow then. So I got out there and I went through some real times. I went through to the man who is now Conway, who's now the Deputy Postmaster General. And at that time, he was the acting chief inspector for the Western region. And when I told him what we wanted to do, he was absolutely four square behind us and thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever heard of. The second one I had to hurdle was Limpy Lee. He was the Chinese postmaster we had in San Francisco. And when I hit him with it, because he had to furnish me the facilities and the space, and I didn't have any sort of credentials from the postmaster general, he says, well, I want to tell you something. He says, I'm very moderate, so people don't really pay much attention to put a program like that in here. But he says, I want to tell you, you'll never get a Chinese alcoholic. If you really insist on it, I'll let you go ahead and do it. Well, so happened the second person we got on the program was Chinese. So Lippy was on my side, and then he gave me an office space down there, which was a rather large place, and we had absolutely nothing. It was a postal service facility that had government furniture in. We took all that out. We painted the walls about every off color we could to try to liven up the joint, and we didn't have any furniture. But I didn't have any counselor either, so that wasn't too bad. And I went around San Francisco and looking for a counselor. I went over to Intergroup and I asked him, who is the person in San Francisco who is the most active for the alcoholic? Who does the most 12-step work? Who puts the most in the program? And the three people I talked to in Intergroup, every one of them said Betty Edwards. So I asked where she lived. He said, oh, she owned, her and her husband own a hotel up here behind the St. Francis. And I called her up and asked her if I could come up and talk to her, and she said, yes, she can come up and talk to me. I said it was about alcoholism and so forth. And uh, I went up there, and here was this lovely hotel in the penthouse up on the top floor of the hotel. This is where Betty Edwards was. And Betty was running the hotel with her husband, Jack. And they had a good money-making place there, and it was a lovely surroundings, and her penthouse had all kinds of beautiful stuff in it. And she was making more money than we even dreamed of, and here I was asking her to take a job dealing with the drunks in a place we didn't even have any furniture on a salary that at that time was about $6,000 a year. And after I explained it to her and talked to her, she says, I'll do it. So she told her husband, I said, Jack, from now on you're going to have to run the hotel. I'm leaving. I'm going down and working in the postal service. Well, a lot of her friends condemned her for that, even Paul down in her group. Gave her a blast, and he gave me a blast every time he saw it for allowing that little woman to go down and work with all the drunks in the post office. Well, thanks to God, she was a dynamo. We got her in there. We didn't have any furniture, so we went up to the hotel and borrowed the furniture from the same hotel and, and outfitted our place. And we started in. So our first bar counselor was Betty. And Betty only worked for us about 20 hours a day. She built it up. And we had to get a second counselor. We, we advertised all over the post office for a recovered alcoholic postal employee. Well, as in most postal programs, nobody believed the program was going to last very long anyway. So as a consequence, nobody applied for the job. We couldn't find a recovered alcoholic in the post office. And we finally found Robbie Duncan. Robbie was black. And we only had about two blacks going to Alcoholics Anonymous in the San Francisco area at that time. So my first two counselors were two women. And they were working women, and they worked day and night, and we were hauling drunks in every place. But to give you an example of the type of people that they were giving us, we had just opened the door for the first time, and Limpy Lee came down with a policeman and brought us a drunk. This guy was a carrier. They found him in a station box on Market Street, which is the busiest street in San Francisco. He was laying halfway in and halfway out of the box. He had a bottle. He had drank in a bottle until he finally started to puke on the mail, and then he passed out, and the bottle was laying on top of him. So he was a beautiful sight to behold. And when the police called up Limpy to find out where to put him, Limpy says, ah, ha, ha, we have an alcoholism place. We'll take him down there, and as soon as he sobers up, we'll fire him. <laughs> so they brought him down, and they brought him into the place. And this was our first test case, and of course there was about three of us around there all working on it at one time. The poor guy didn't have a chance. We, at first we had to sober him up. And we got all through and we found out that he was being dispossessed that day from his place. He had five children, he had a wife who just left him, and now he's going to get fired. 
So we called up the lawyer, and the lawyer got the dispossession put away for 60 days. We went home and talked to his kids, and his five kids had only one thing. I hate the son of a bitch, I hope he dies. And that was about the theme throughout, and these kids were only about seven, eight, nine, ten years old. His wife, we talked to the wife, and Betty talked to her at great length, and finally convinced her the man might have an illness. And if she put up with all this crap for all these years, she ought to stay just a little bit longer and see if we could, couldn't get the guy sober and keep him sober.